Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks all for joining. So now uh, let's get started. Um, so in the in the previous lectures, uh, uh, we've introduced the foundations for large language models and also talked about why uh, safety is important. And today is going to and we are going to start a new section for the class uh, focusing on interpretability. So in the next uh, few lectures, we are going to cover uh, different uh, perspectives of uh, interpretability. So today is the first lecture on interpretability uh, in this class. Uh, it's our great uh, honor uh, and pleasure to have um, David Bao from Northeastern University uh, to give the uh, the guest lecture on direct model editing uh, and the large model interpretability. Uh, so David is a professor at Northeastern University and has done a lot of great work uh, in uh, interpret interpretability and also more broadly in, I think, HCI and uh, machine learning in general. And uh, so uh, with that, uh, uh, please, David. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everybody. I know that you guys are doing most of the class meetings in person, and this is a, you know, sort of one of the Zoom meetings. And so I have to warn you in advance, this lecture is designed to be in person, and some of the parts of the lecture are going to ask you guys questions. So I love it. It just makes it a little bit more fun for me if when I ask questions, if you guys, you know, uh, turn on your cameras, raise your hand, whatever, it's, it makes it more fun. So let me get into it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about interpretability. And so basically, the what is interpretability about? What is this field about? And we ask a really simple question, right, which is why, right? You know, uh, a, a lot of a lot of neural network work is about how to get a network to work well, and we like to ask the question: Why did it? Why did the ne neural network work well, or or badly? Why did it make that decision? And so let me let me um, back up and and say you know you, typically we already have a a lot of tools that we use to do this uh, even in elementary neural network uh, uh, classes uh, we teach you some of these tools. So typically, you know, you, if you train a classifier or something like that, um, there's already uh, a basic thing that we teach everybody, which is that the way to evaluate the accuracy of your classifier, so the example here is, is, is an image classifier. It's going to classify images in one of 300 or so classes uh, according to what kind of place they are. Um, but to see if the, 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 the network is really learning what we hope it learns, we don't care about whether the network can predict this training image as a baseball field. What we care about is whether the network can get the idea of what a baseball field is, and we test it by uh, testing it on, you know, a secret holdout set. So if we if we present baseball images that the network has never seen before and it it, it classifies them accurately. Then, then we feel pretty good about what we're doing. We call it, we 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 say our model is generalizing well, and so so that's that's the standard state of the art way of um, of uh, interpreting whether a model is just fitting, overfitting a function, or actually generalizing and learning the concepts that we care about, which is sort of what we're after. But there's something dissatisfying about that, right? Which is, you know, sure. The, the network can identify what a baseball field is, but we maybe we're interested in what it really learned, like how it's doing that. What is it looking at in this image? How does it know um, that this is a baseball field? And so um, for a bunch of years after um, uh, uh, the AlexNet uh, network really proved really high performance at image classification, uh, there's been a lot of methods in pursuing the following strategy. And I'll just show you what. Uh, so you, if you if you go and you do a Google search or you search on archive for interpretability papers, interpretability papers, um, you'll find that there's a, a lot that um, pursue uh, visualizations and measurements like this. And th these these ask, you know, what did the network look at to make the decision that uh, that it did. And so this is a heat map. Um, this is it's called a salience map, and you can make them in a bunch of ways. Uh, I, I I I gave a paper that had a survey um, 
of, of a bunch of the ways. But like, for example, you could mask out random parts of the image and see which parts of the image the classifier is more sensitive to. And so what I've shown here is, um, is a visualization where the parts of the um, uh, parts of the uh, image that the, the network is most sensitive to are shown in yellow. And so this is where the, the network is looking. And so if you kind of, if you go back and forth, you can kind of see, um, yeah, it, it's like looking at the baseball players. That makes sense. Like if you want to identify that there's a baseball image, you look at the baseball players. Okay, but so we're, we're, there's a lot of methods for doing this. I'm using GradCamp to show this one, but but there can be something dissatisfying about that too, because it leaves open the question, why? Why is the network looking there? Can we understand that in a little bit more detail that it's looking at these these people? Um, and it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, you can guess why, but uh, but it's but but let's let's see if we can understand what the mechanism that the model is using by debugging the network piece by piece. So I'm going to show you a bunch of methods in today's talk that look at an aspect of interpretability, which is sort of analogous to debugging programs. Uh, so, for example, a convolutional neural network has, uh, you know, thousands of different types of neurons, and we can ask which ones are important. So it's kind of like um, commenting out pieces of code. We can take a neuron and we can set it to, you know, we can remove it from the network. We could set it to zero, just like turning it off. And we can ask, did that have any effect on this task that it's doing? And so just like a big program, if you commented out a line of code and you were interested in a specific behavior, um, most things that you remove don't really have much of an effect on the output. So this network uh, unit didn't. Uh, you know, this one doesn't change anything. Um, most of the units don't, um, but there's a few that do. Like this one, if you turn it off, uh, unit 208 or just a few units, it actually changes the classification of the network. These are the, the most decisive uh, neurons in the network. So let's take a look. So now that lets us narrow the question. Instead of asking what is a whole network looking at, we can ask what do these important neurons look at? So what are these specific units looking at? And so let me visualize this. This is another, this is the same um, sort of heat map technology. I'm just drawing it in a different way so you can see what's underneath the heat map. And and so this, this is where uh, this unit is firing the strongest. So there's one that's looking at like, I don't know, the bend in people's elbows and you know the, the, their clothing and their pants. And this one looks like it's looking at their, maybe at their heads, right? The tops of their bodies. It's kind of interesting. So let's ask, you know, so now, but just looking at one image, we can't really tell what this image, what this unit is looking at. And so to actually answer that, we want to ask a more generalized question. But once we've chosen a specific unit, it allows us to ask a more um, broad question. We can ask in general, not just in this image, what does neuron number 208 look at. And so here, I'll show you what, what, what it does. So here's here's a uh, top 1% activations of this unit across the you know a large data set of hundreds of thousands of images. So this is this is uh, this is what the neuron is activating. And so okay, so question number one, everybody. So what is it detecting? I, I'd, I'd love somebody to unmute and just chime in and say, what is this? What is what is this neuron? What is this neuron looking for here? Oh, come on. Somebody, brave. Okay. Get to meet David. Yes, heads. Who said heads? That's great. Is it is it detecting heads? Does anybody have a better answer than, uh, so I see in text, faces is good. Uh, heads uh, and faces. Professions. Um, professions, maybe. Yes, there's some professions, although there's a lot of professions throughout. Let, let, let me show you a counter example for faces. So see this half a face here? See, there's a face. It like the unit doesn't seem to be looking at that. Look at all these heads over here. Look at these guys. Look at this. Like there's like a whole crowd of people with heads. Hats. Ha oh, ha. Hats. Yes. I actually, I you know, I I I found this unit because I was you know I had a, a program to automatically annotate what units are looking for, and and my annotation said, oh yeah, this is looking for heads. It's looking for tops of people and heads, and things like this. And, but it was not very good at it. So it took me a while before I went around and look, looked at this unit. Um, but when I looked at it by hand, I was like, it's missing a lot of the heads. This is why it's so bad. And then somebody pointed out to me that it's getting all the hats. I did not recognize this at first. And and I don't have good annotation data on hats. So there was like, we did not train this network 
to recognize hats. We trained it to recognize things like places, like baseball fields. So why would it be interesting to recognize hats if you're interested in recognizing baseball fields? Well, baseball is like the only sport where they wear hats. And so so it's 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 the salient feature. So it's very interesting. It gives you insights. Um, and the the cool thing about this is this is, you know, this was not long after uh, AlexNet, ImageNet sort of classifiers uh, came out. And you could already see uh, from doing interpretability work like this that these neural networks were succeeding in developing their own detectors for concepts in a very weakly supervised way. Um, without explicit uh, supervision on what kinds of things they should be looking for, they're really just, you know, you could see that there are concepts that are not obvious in the training data that they are distilling on their own. And so really interesting. Um, so I, I trained my network to label scenes. It found hats, right? You know, this is sort of the question. What are these networks learning? And, you know, so I think... At this juncture and this class that you're taking, I think the thing to really, you know, I think it's it's good to be amazed at these models. The deep networks are generally su genuinely surprising, right? Even in the earliest days uh, with perceptrons, uh, you know, Rosenblatt was surprised that he could get these things to learn at all. And then, uh, you know, the the work in the 80s was amazing that you could really uh, train networks to solve non-trivial problems. And then that, you know, there, there was this whole explosion of machine learning. But then all of a sudden in 2012, this idea that this ancient idea of neural networks would be uh, sort of outperforming all the other machine learning methods was very, very surprising in 2012. And um, and then now we're actually going through yet another round of surprise. Um, I wouldn't minimize it. Sometimes it doesn't feel like there's been a gap between the 2012 rush and, and now, but I think that we're really uh, facing some new things because We've got these models that really have these emerging capabilities like meta learning that people not long ago thought that you would com need completely different learning architectures to do. And instead of new learning architectures, really we're doing the same thing. You know, we're we're we are we are training these things using the same techniques we did in the 80s, and the architectures are only a little bit different. Um and the the thing that's really changed in each between each of those surprises is we've just been making the networks bigger. And we've caught, kind of caught on to that, so we're even accelerating uh, that now. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, you know, uh, uh, skip a couple things here just for time. Um, but for what do I mean by meta learning? So, uh, so you guys are you know, may be familiar with the idea of in context learning. So, but if you're not, this is this is uh, okay. Somebody tell me what is the what is the missing. Uh, answer here: If we ask a language model that's sufficiently well trained to complete this um, this piece of text, this is the input to the model. What comes next? Oh, somebody can tell me what comes next. Tell me what comes next here. I know that you humans are good meta learners. Yes, five, five, five. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Five. Yes, and so what did you do there, right? So basically, you had to recognize the pattern. If I gave you a different pattern with the same numbers, uh, then you would predict something else. So what would you predict here? Yes, I noticed that you were very careful not to put the digit nine there, but to spell it out. And so, you know, so basically, to predict all these things, a model needs to learn something. And 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 so, the typical thing that we do in machine learning is we take our uh, data set, and we use it to drive um, a parameter learning process, maybe through gradient descent, and um, and we get a model out, and the mo and we we can see whether the model solves the problem well or not. And then so this problem of like uh, trying to train a model from a very small number of uh, examples is called few shot learning, and few shot learning was its whole own you know division of machine learning. Uh, a lot of people uh, develop few shot learning methods. And so the, the stunning thing, though, is th this, this is not a regular few-shot learning method. This is just it providing input to the language model. And somehow, it does the learning internally without us driving any external parameter, uh, parameter learning method in it. So there's a bunch of ongoing debate right now about how it is that language models seem to be able to simulate small few-shot learning processes uh, it, just during inference, just by running them to predict a model. And so... 
this this kind of uh learning to learn and uh you know learning to adapt quickly to um to uh to inputs was something that people thought would require completely new learning architectures not that many years ago just two or three years ago and the idea that uh that you don't need a learning architecture that if you just train an auto regressive language model and you just train it big it will learn how to do this on its own was i think a real shocker i think a genuine surprise and that's sort of the era that we're living through now uh, i think there's a series of real big surprises um of what just comes out of scale and uh and so so uh so these models are learning to do this thing that humans thought would require some special kind of cleverness you give some demonstrations you ask a query it makes this prediction it can do few shot learning right what is the learning algorithm that these things have learned i mean there are profound questions about how these llms are working and we really don't know the answer to them okay so uh and now you could uh, take this kind of approach you could say hey can you explain what you're doing yeah i like this you know maybe you can explain uh have the network explain itself to you okay so a question which is what is few shot learning it's very simple when you train a model you normally have uh you know hundreds thousands millions of examples that you train a model to but um and so all few shot learning is is the question um instead of supervising a model with um with many many labeled pairs like thousands or millions of labeled pairs can you get away with a handful like a dozen or 20 or five right if you just have five labeled pairs is that enough to get a classifier to work well and there are are different ground game you know sort of ground rules that people have set in the few shot learning uh game they might say oh yeah but you know you're allowed to have pre-trained your model on unrelated um images maybe different classes or something you maybe pre-trained an image net or something like that but if you if somebody showed up with you know five new classes of images and only gave you a couple examples of each one how well could you do how 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 could you adjust the parameters to learn so that's what few shot learning is and basically what we found is that you don't really need to do few shot learning now if you have these massive models they are they they internally to themselves are performing and outperforming many of the few shot learning um uh, uh methods just by providing examples like this on the input and so here the example is you know we give these triplets 3 to 15 8 14 32 there's some pattern here and after giving even just 10 examples the network is you know catching on to the pattern well enough that it could predict nine so that you know like gpt3 has no trouble uh answering something like this and putting the spelled out word nine and if i ask gpt3 explain your pattern here then it's happy to explain to us itself right it's actually kind of remarkable and you have a little bit of explainability in english here uh it's explaining how it got to the third number although it's a little bit odd you know one i highlighted in yellow 11 it says for example in the first ele- there's no 11 here i did not provide 11 it like hallucinated its explanation a little bit but yeah you know it's pretty good now the weird thing is that it doesn't totally tell me what's going on well, anything else i need to follow the pattern like you guys spelled out the word n i n e and i'm trying to get gpt3 to tell me that it did that and I, there's nothing i i've tried having these conversations about this example with gpt3 and it, it it will not explain to me that this is one of the things it did but it's capable of doing it and this is kind of one of these neat examples where um uh where a model is capable of doing something but it can't really explain to you what it's doing so it sort of leads to this question i think that we're going to see this a lot uh as language models uh get deployed in society that some people may argue that their english language explanations that they gave give uh when you ask them can you explain yourself they may be enough for model interpretation and and that's sort of a a question for you to think about do you think that these english language explanations are enough now i don't think they're enough um and that's what this talk is about um and so let me um let me let me give you another example here from uh dali so these diffusion models um so if you if you go to uh any of these models if you go to a stable diffusion or regenerate anything and you ask them uh you know draw me a a scene one of my favorite things to do as a computer vision person is to ask for a scene with a lamp in it because these models are increasingly amazing you can see that they uh not only draw a lamp but they you know 
reflect light out of the lamp, reflecting against the wall, reflecting on other objects. You know, you can see all these light transport effects, which are actually quite challenging to get right. And the diffusion models seem to be doing it effortlessly. And so to, 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 to study this, I asked my student, you know, let's make a data set of uh, lights that are on and lights that are off in these diffusion models. You know, so we'll see, here's some lights that are on and here's some lights that are off. Wait a second. Like, huh, what is going on here? These lights are not off. Okay, well, let's, let's let, no matter what we try, right, you know, the diffusion model will not give us lights that are off. And so the so what is going on here? So it's not just that we didn't like choose the right prompt. Like all the prompts that we try have this problem, where the diffusion model is sort of not giving us lights that are turned off. And the problem here, and the the reason that you see this, and you can see this in all the diffusion models that you can try, is that there's a really strong bias in the data set. Um, think of it this way, right? The the way that we program a, a large model is through a data set. And a data set is like the world's worst programming interface. It's this huge million or billion size, you know, piece of data that's way too big for anybody to look at and understand what's in there. It can take millions of dollars to create. It can take months and months to use in training. And and then meanwhile, you know, after all of this work, right, it's just full of missing concepts, mistakes, ambiguities, biases. And we have no idea what they all are. And so one of the biases that showed up in uh, the training data for images, which is all trained on caption data, is the idea that like if you have you have plenty of images where there's like a lamp in the image, if you collect billions of images, and, and there's plenty of captions that might say um, that this is a lamp or something like that. But think about it. If you've got a room with a lamp in it, if the lamp was on, you might say, oh, this is a very bright lamp that somebody left the lamp on, it's turned on. But if there's a room with that happens to have a lamp in it and the lamp's not turned on, you just wouldn't, it's, you, you probably wouldn't say that this lamp is turned off. Like this lamp is unlit, it's a darkened lamp, it's a turned off lamp. Like it's just not something you would say. It, it, it would be like saying this person is not running or something like that. You just, you, people don't talk in the negative when they write captions. And and so because of this, uh, if you go to these models and you ask for these kinds of things like a negative, like, you know, a lamp that's turned off or something like that, like they, they don't know how to follow your instructions. And so um, so the goal is this. Now, the, the thing is, these models do know how to draw lamps that are not turned on, but just English is failing at allowing us to, to, to get, get at this. And so the goal of a bunch of my work in interpretability is direct model editing. Can we put people more closely, directly in touch with what the model is doing, how it's working? Can we give people access to the concepts that they have? Um, and so let me show you how to, to, to do this with LAMPS. Uh, this is a little bit older work with GANs. It's funny that it's just a few years ago that GANs were all the, the rage, but diffusion models have taken over. This is a little bit before diffusion models came out. And what you can do is you can do the same exercise with a GAN generator, this is a generate, generative image model that makes uh, realistic images of bedrooms. And you can kind of do the same exercise that I was showing you with uh, baseball hats. You can you can take an individual unit and you can ask what are its effects on a scene. So let's take a scene here where there's like a lamp that is interesting to us. It's like, it's like turned on. And what we can do is we can ask, what does this neuron do during the generation of the scene. I'm, I'll define a procedure. I'm going to repeat it for all the neurons. And so what we'll do is we will say, I am interested in this aspect of the scene. I'm interested in how the light comes out of this lamp. So let's make a little mask that shows where the light reflection pixels are in the image. And then I'm going to hunt for neurons that seem to be causal for these pixels. And one way that we could do it is we could turn this neuron off and see what effect it has when we regenerate the image. And so here's here's what it looks like in this case. You can see that when I turn that neuron off, it has a little bit different behavior uh, in the image. And and if I if I were to take the difference image and multiply it by my mask and uh, sum up the differences, I can get a number, I can get a score that says how much of the difference actually lands in the target region that I care about. And that gives me like a ranking function 
over all the neurons. It only takes a fraction of a second to compute a score for a neuron. So I can sort all the neurons in the network according to how much uh, they cause. They seem to cause this um, this visual effect. And so here's here's my little search engine that we created. Uh, and um, and so yeah, this approach is quite scalable because that you know even though these models have billions of parameters, uh, you know it it really doesn't take long to 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 search through all of them. Now the issue with it uh, is is that um, is that only certain models are disentangled well enough that you can find concepts by looking at neurons. So StyleGAN, uh, especially StyleGAN two, is protect is particularly good at disentangling its concepts. I think that, uh, you know, I'm not sure that uh, theoreticians have a good understanding of why some models are better at disentangling than not, but but the StyleGAN models are superb at disentangling uh, concepts. And so so what you can do is you can you can search through all the neurons. I, we, we can discuss that at the end a little bit, what disentanglement means. But I want to um, uh, sort of continue on with the story here. And um, and so it really it really just takes a few seconds to rank all the neurons according to a simple scoring function like this. It, it, one of the reasons it's so fast is because you, we're just scoring it based on effects of a single image. We're not looking at it over you know a, a large data set or anything. And and so these are these are the neurons that had the most effect over those like light reflections in that one image. Now the interesting thing though is that you do get a lot of interesting uh, uh, separated. Um, effects here. So th there is a neuron that affects task lighting. There's neuron 265. This is actually, this one here is affecting the size of a lampshade. Right? It's kind of interesting. This one only ref affects the reflections on the wall, like how shiny the walls are to light. And then this one is interesting. It's like the the, the warmth of the light, like whether it's a, a bluish light or a, an orangish light, a sort of color temperature, which is a, a surprise to us. And so, um, and it generalizes. So I'm showing you uh, different images here that were produced by the GAN, and I'll modulate that first neuron on and off, and you can see that um, that the, the the GAN really is using this neuron to turn lights on and off. So by looking into a network, there's this promise that we might be able to identify concepts that we might not even be able to find using text. Um, this is sort of more more successful than asking a diffusion model through text to turn off the lamps. Make sense? And I also want you to, oh, so this is more, it's just more lamps. We can show you a lot of images of these things turning on and off. Uh, this On the right here, I've shown a different neuron. This is not supposed to be turning the light on and off. It's actually t changing the color temperature. So this is the color temperature neuron. You can see it getting bluish and orangish. Okay, so what have we done here? So we found, we found a change, an interesting thing that we're interested in. Um, we searched for causal effects. Um, we searched for like the the relevant causal components, and then after we found causal components, we we tried to verify the effects um, by checking for generalization on like different images, different situations, uh, by altering the network, testing our ability to change things according to what we've learned. So the, the so, so there's a couple principles. For interpretability that I would advocate, uh, one is that you know in in sort of in the old days we we would look for all these saliency maps, which are sort of these correlative signals of of uh, you know what what kinds of what kinds of things correlate with um, uh, with certain behavior of the model. But I think that the 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 most interesting things are causal. So causal tracing, so looking for causal effects, um, has you know, really does a better job at revealing mechanisms that uh, it's harder to get fooled when you're looking for causal effects. And then, but then, but then still, we we work with such large systems. Sometimes you have causal coincidences, and so you really want to, you know, uh, you we want to verify your understanding uh, by checking your ability to actually make changes based on what you've learned, uh, and see if those changes generalize over other situations. So. Um, so let's okay. So this course is supposed to be about uh, transformers, large language models. So let's take a look at uh, you know example. Um, I think yeah, this is GPT two XL. Actually, a lot of the experiments I'm going to show you are uh, for larger models. And again, we have this situation where it's a you know these GPT models are trained unsupervised um, on a lot of text, and we're not really sure uh, what they're doing. 
um, you know, after enough training, we get things like meta learning, where you just give these demonstrations and, you know, it can make these predictions. So let's ask the question, right? How does a network make in context learn predictions? So I'm going to talk about one of the papers from my uh, students recently. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to ask uh, what triggers in context learning. And so let's take a look at this particular example of in context learning here. Right. So if anybody's not familiar with in context learning, I can slow down here, but you know, just, just pipe up in the chat and I'm happy to explain it in a little bit more detail. Um, but what, what we're, what we're showing here at the top is, you know, this is just showing a few examples. The model has learned how to imitate antonyms, uh, like an antonym function. And so to the left of the colon, to the right of the colon are like the inputs and outputs to some function. And you can think of what the model is doing is it's actually learning to model this function from inputs to outputs, from arrive to depart, from small to big. And then after you give it enough examples, it can do another one. Um, down here, it's the English to Spanish function. And, and you can have other functions. People have functions that uh, they, they use in context learning to, to train that are much more uh, complicated than this. They, not easy to fit on a slide, but summarization, uh, information extraction, you know, finding, uh, you know, what what is the relevant drug name in a long piece of medical text or something like that, or tell me whether this uh, statement is true or false and figure out the logic of it or something like that. You can give lots of uh, examples and eventually the models will figure out what you're trying to do and it'll, it'll do them. Is there a common mechanism that underlies all in-context learning or is each one of these situations just different? Um, so when asking this kind of question is like the emblematic of like hard interpretability questions that we face. And so like when you're doing interpretability over a large network, you face these questions like what are the right abstractions for understanding what thinking is, right? Like uh, should we be looking at choices or likelihoods, distributions? Should we be looking at learned tasks? Should we be looking at known facts? I think that, you know, it's it's... Unlike biology, where I think that there was eventually there was a consensus that people should understand the action of genes, um, I don't know if we know what the right level of abstraction is yet in understanding how machine learning models actually execute their 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 algorithms. Um, and then you can ask, even if you understand things in the abstract, like in, on an information theory basis, is there a physical basis uh, to how things seem to work? You know, can we actually go and find neurons? Uh, that do things, or are, are things just very diffuse? And we should think of things more like, you know, the way that physicists think about like pressure and temperature, and these are just like big, um, you know, massive effects uh, rather than things about individual components, right? Can we understand neurons, gradients, or things like attention heads or circuits? These are these are open questions. Um, and then, but then if, if you can understand even components, then you can ask the more detailed question. Can you explicitly code them or decode them? Can we, can we edit things directly because we understand what, what code, what the internal language of the systems are? And so I think like by analogy in biology, the answer to all these things is yes. We know the right level of abstraction. There is a physical basis for heredity. It is DNA and it's divided into genes. And we know the, the code explicitly. Uh, the week after COVID came out, they decoded the the the, the genes, and uh, we knew the proteins um, and what the uh, you know sort of vaccine targets would be a couple of days later. And so, I think the one reasonable question is, you know, can we ever get to that point in machine learning? So these are very fundamental fundamental questions about what thinking is, and um, and so let's let's go through the example of in context learning here. So I'm showing you the end of a prompt you know, small, big, common, and then, you know, the opposite, this is the antonym ICL task. And, you know, the, the this this model can do it, right? It, 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 the prediction that it's going to make is the word rare. And what we're facing is we have this, so if I draw the transformer like this, does this make sense what I'm drawing here, right? This is a, the transformer is a grid of states uh, that the inputs come in on the left, they're encoded into vectors. And the vectors, uh, one vector for each token passes through the layers. I've, I've drawn the transformer horizontally here. So the layers advance from left to right. And then in, in red is this autoregressive attention uh, mechanism where every, uh, every, every token can look at previous tokens. And then there's in green, there's this MLP uh, mechanism 
where as you pass from layers to layers, it goes through a small feed forward neural network that can, you know, sort of mutate the, the, the vectors a bit as you go from layers to layer. And, um, and so, uh, so yeah, so in context learning, you know, sort of, you know, it, it passes through this network just like any other text does, and it can execute uh, these this some amazing learning algorithm. What what does it? Are the, can we identify what component causes ICL? Can we find the circuit for ICL? So let's 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 do this. And the idea is let's do it by transplanting data to identify effects. And what do I mean by transplanting data? I'll show you how we do it. So we're going to run the network twice, right? And we're going to run the network once in a condition where it can do it. It can it, small, big, common, rare, right? So like where it works. And then I'm going to run the network a second time in a scrambled condition where I take all the words and I scramble them so that there's nothing to learn here. So quiet has no relation to dry. I can I could supply it with 10 scrambled examples like this. And at the end, I can still end with common, but it's not going to say rare because it has no idea what it is that it's trying to learn here. I, I mean, I haven't given it good training data. Does that make sense? And so now what our goal is going to be is, our, our goal is going to be, can we identify where in the network is learned how to make the output rare from common? And so the way we're going to do it is we're going to monitor the output, the output probability distribution of this sort of diseased network this this corrupted network and then meanwhile we're going to take individual components and we're going to hotwire them from the clean network which is capable of doing the right computation into the corrupted network which is not able to do it and most of the time when we patch things over it has no effect it's just going to continue to be corrupted but once in a while if we patch over just the right component then what will happen is we'll look at the output here and it will boost the probability of the antonym task. It'll boost the probability of saying rare. And so what that would suggest to us is that there's some information at this point in the network which is asking the network, please you know, do an antonym, right? And it's actually even better if this... Uh, if if we if we do this and it's not common, if I use the word big here, and it goes to small, then it actually helps me disambiguate from uh, bringing the idea of doing antonyms over from just bringing over the word rare. So we set this kind of thing up, and you know we try to figure out if we can uh, 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 see which what one of these components causes the um, uh, the target. Uh, behavior to uh, to rise the most. It's just like the lamp experiment that I showed you. It's just a little less visual, and it gives us a ranking function. We can we can create a sorting of all of the components that we test to see which ones are the most effective. In this case, we are sorting through the attention heads of a transformer network, and so you know, so the transformer network has about. Uh, you know, uh, a couple hundred attention heads, uh, depending on the size of the network that you're looking at. And so in blue, so this is a diagram of all the attention heads over uh, a network that has about 27 layers. And, and in blue, I'm highlighting the attention heads that have the strongest causal effect um, at boosting correct ICL results. Now, the interesting thing is that when we make such rankings and we make such catalogs, we actually, I, we actually find that it's approximately the same ranking, the same set of heads, regardless of which ICL task we use to uh, collect them. And so, um, so this is this was actually kind of surprising for us. We we imagined that maybe each task would have a different set of attention heads, but we found that it was actually the same set of attention heads across a wide variety of tasks. We have dozens of tasks that we have. Um, tested in this way across different levels of complexity and it's basically the same attention heads and these attention heads have a very distinctive pattern uh, regardless of the task and so I, I can show you the example this is what uh, each row here is one of the 10 attention heads that's most influential and you can see uh, what they are attending to um, 
with this little heat map. And they're basically, if you have analogies, they're always attending to the output to the second word in the analogy. Um, and so, uh, so it's kind of interesting. So we still know exactly what these attention heads are doing by looking at this, but they are, um, they, you know, it's, it's giving us a sense for what is in this circuit and the circuit is smaller than we might imagine. And we can actually kind of decode the circuit by, um, by going to the attention heads and just summing up what all their output is. So what we do here is two steps. We average each attention head over a few examples of a task. And then we go to the 10 attention heads averages and we just add them up for a specific task. And so what that gives us is a vector. This VT is something we call a function vector for the task, for the function T. So if we have like uh, the antonym task here, then we can gather a function vector from the 10 attention heads uh, at this moment. And, and it's the thing that, the, that the, these attention heads are doing when we're doing antonyms. Or we could get a function vector when it's doing um, English to Spanish translation. Now, if we, if we take this function vector, um, you know, we, can, we, can, we can try to test it now uh, to see if it generalizes. Um, and so what we what we're doing here is we have just some other neutral sentence, just a regular plain piece of text. The word fast means something. It would normally say the word fast means quick or something like that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this function vector and I'm going to transplant it into the network by just inserting it into place at the last hidden state. And then when you do that, instead of the text generation saying the, flat, the word fast means quick or something like this, it causes the network to say the, fa the word fast means slow. So in a sense, you know, we've transplanted the idea that the network should be doing opposites, should be doing antonyms into a small vector that we can move around and put anywhere in the network and it will cause the network to do antonyms. And similarly, if we take this net, the, the same sentence, we move over the vector from these examples on Spanish, and move them over, it will cause the network uh, to translate things to Spanish. And so, so, is, it, so think about what we've done here, right? We've we've used causal effects to identify some mechanism, and then we've taken a different setting to see if the what we've learned about the mechanism generalizes. If we can actually make a change uh, that's different from the way that we collected uh, the the insight. Um, there's other ways that we can check on this insight. So. Like, so for example, we can check on function vector arithmetic. Now, now here's another quiz for you guys to make sure that you're awake. Um, uh, here's, here's a few tasks. I have defined three tasks. And for, so the tasks will actually take a list as input. So this is like the summarization tasks where you might have a large body of text as input. And so at my example input, is a list of five countries, Italy, Russia, China, Japan, and France. And uh, and like an example task would be to give me the first thing on the list. And if I, if I gave a model like 10 examples of lists followed by giving me the first thing on the list, then the model would be able to learn that very easily um, uh, using ICL. And it would continue to follow the pattern of giving me the first thing on the list. So I call that task first copy, and we can get a function vector for that. Um, we, we could have a more challenging thing over the list. We could say, don't give me the first thing in the list. These are all country names. Give me the capital of that first thing in the list. And the answer for that would be Rome. I could do other things. I could say, well, why don't you just copy the last country in the list, right? And then that the answer for that would be France. And each of these corresponds to some function vector, okay? So, so now what if... I took these function vectors and added them up in the following way. What if I took, uh, you know, um, the last copy function vector, added the first capital function vector, and subtracted the first copy function vector? Well, then I get some other vector, uh, which I just call v star bd here. And the hypothesis is that maybe this vector encodes a task last capital, 
right? So like, what would be the answer to last capital um, if that was a thing? So that's my question to you guys. Like what's behind these question marks? Any guesses? Yes, Paris. So somebody's awake. Thanks, Drew. Um, it turns out that when I do this uh, vector arithmetic, it does indeed create a function vector that if I do the kind of intervention that I described in the previous slide, it will cause the model to, to do parents. So this, this is a completely unseen task. In none of the examples that I've given, uh, has it ever seen this task demonstrated, but it actually performs this task very well. Actually, if I use a function vector in this case to perform this task on GPTJ, um, it actually performs the task with uh, higher accuracy, with not even robust, it's like higher than baseline accuracy. If I try to use ICL to get GPTJ to perform this task, it can kind of do it, but it misses it a lot. If I use this function vector arithmetic to get a function vector to perform this task, it will actually outperform uh, ICL itself. So I don't think that's true for the, small, the stronger models. If we do it on like Llama 60B, then Llama 60B is like good at ICL um, and you can't outperform it using function vector arithmetic. But it was weird the first time that we tried it on GPTJ and it actually outperformed ICL itself. Um, okay, so yes, is it comparably robust? I guess depending on your definition for robust, yes, it's comparably robust. Maybe it's even more robust. Make sense? All right, so, uh, so what did we do here? We specified a change, we searched for causal computations, we checked generalization, right? So now I'm kind of out of time. Who, who, who here is familiar with the Rome paper? Rome. Anybody familiar with the Rome paper? Great. I, I want to just mention this other uh, result that was it's from a couple years ago, but I think it's one of the most important results out of my lab. So I just want to survey it before we wrap up. And this is this is a very similar setting to the question of asking how does ICL work? But here we're asking, can we can we figure out where a model stores its factual knowledge, right? So like, you know, factual knowledge, like Miles Davis plays the trumpet, right? This is like one of the things that these models are amazing at. You can ask them all sorts of trivia and they will know all sorts of things about the real world, both uh, like encyclopedic facts and common sense facts about the world. Uh, they're really remarkable at this. And so they must be storing these facts somewhere. And the question is, can we figure out what the mechanism is that they're using to store these facts? And so we're going to do the same exercise here. We're going to run the network twice. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to destroy the ability for the network to be able to recall the, the fact that Miles Davis played the trumpet. And the way that we'll do that is we'll corrupt the input. We'll make it so that the network can't hear the name Miles Davis. And then when we corrupt uh, the input, then it's no longer able to predict the trumpet. That's predictable. And then what we're going to do is we're going to see if there are hidden states that cause the model to be able to recall that the answer is trumpet. And as we go around the network, most of the hidden states don't have any effect, but some hidden states do and cause it to say trumpet. And then we can draw heat maps that show like a little, um, uh, like a sort function for which of the components have the strongest causal effects. And so in this heat map, I have, well, I've taken a different sentence here Brian De Palma works in the area and he's a filmmaker. And in dark purple, we've shown you the hidden states that when you corrupt the sentence, still cause the sentence to output film. And in white are all the states which have no effect at causing you to say film. And so it's unsurprising that at the end of the network, you can do this because these are the hidden states that are right before the output of the word film. They These are states that literally decode to the word film. And so by if, if the network was corrupted and was going to say something else, like, you know, works in the area of sports or something like that, um, if it, it's not surprising that if you just pop in the encoding for film at this location, then it should say film. So this this these strong interventions at site B are not interesting. What was shocking to us is that we had these strong effects much, much earlier in the network at site A. And so the, the hypothesis that comes out, and you see this in a lot of different uh, examples where you've got this early site that has strong causal effects. It's very, very um, distinctive. The hypothesis is that this early site is where factual retrieval is happening. It's where we, we realize 
the difference between Shaquille O'Neal and Megan Rapinoe, that 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 that's the that's the moment when the retrieval is happening, and it's just sort of translated into the word soccer at the late site. And so when we average this sort of causal map over a thousand factual statements, then you can see that the the effects are systematic. Now what we've what I've shown you here on the right is separating them into MLP and attention causal effects, and you can see that. At the late site, it's attention that's really important. And at the early, early site, it's actually MLP modules that are really important. And so this is another hint that there's something different going on at the early and late site, that maybe the late site is about transporting the information, using attention to move it from one place to another. But the early site, the causality comes from something that the MLPs are doing. And so to, to double check what we've done here, we, we built a hypothesis for how the MLPs might be operating. And so the idea is that an MLP might be an associative memory uh, that maps an input to an output. So for example, uh, that might map uh, the Eiffel Tower to Paris or the Space Needle to Seattle. Um, and so this is an old idea. This comes from 1972 that neural network layers uh, can store such mappings. It's just something that falls directly out of the fact that a neural network layer is a linear system of equations. And so you can always solve a linear system of equations to associate any input and any output. If you solve the system of equations, you can get a matrix that solves them. And you can you can actually pack in more uh, pairs if you're willing to absorb some error and solve this as a least squares problem. And so um, so what, what, we, what we do is we say, well, if that's the case, then we should be able to change a memory wherever it's stored uh, by altering the uh, the mapping from inputs to outputs by altering this matrix, so you, you can you can solve the linear algebra to um, to what you would need to do to uh, make a minimal change to a layer of a neural network to change a single association between input vectors and output vectors, and so that's that's you know so that's something that we do, um, and uh, and so without any gradient descent on this matrix at all, you can just patch it to um, to make it map now from V star or K star to V star for any new B and K that you might choose. And so, so okay, so I'm, I'm gonna skip through the math here because not enough time, but it's just algebra. You know, instead of instead of doing gradient descent, you can you can edit a network directly to change its an association between vectors. And so the idea is, if we can find a vector for like the space needle and find a vector for, instead of Seattle, let's pick a different uh, thing. Let's find a vector for Rome. Then what we can do is we can edit the model so that uh, the layer maps from the space needle to Rome instead of the space needle to Seattle. And when we do that, then when we run the model, then it will predict Rome instead. But the cool thing is you want to test it on generalization and so if you ask for the initial question that you asked it, of course, it'll say Rome. But if you reword your question, ask it in a different way, it'll, it'll give you all sorts of different contexts, like say, oh, you should learn Latin, you should eat pasta instead of burgers. Um, and, and so what the research here uh, does to try to you know, square the circle is it tests both specificity and generalization. We want to make sure that if we do this direct editing on a fact that it generalizes, that if you rephrase statements of the fact in different ways, that the model will continue to reflect the new rewritten fact that you've tried to insert in the model. And then for specificity, we wanna make sure if we rewrite a fact that we're not changing all sorts of unexpected, undesired things in the model. If we move the space needle to Rome, we don't want to see that Bill Gates is also born in Rome, that would indicate that maybe we've renamed Seattle to Rome or something like that, rather than actually changing the, the specific association that we care about. Or even worse, if everything is in Rome, if the Empire State Building is in Rome and you know Statue of Liberty is in Rome, then maybe we've just completely overwritten the model so that it just says Rome as the answer to everything, which is not desirable. So, so if we measure specificity and trade-off and we sort of compare it to traditional methods, so like regular fine tuning is here in red, meta learning here is in purple, uh, sort of the state of the art methods for changing facts and our, our Rome and Mehmet methods 
are here up to the right hand corner. And so uh, higher generalization and specificity are up and to the right. So actually, oddly enough, if you just go directly into matrices and you edit them, you get better generalization and specificity than uh, than than you know what we typically do for editing editing things. Now, um, there's been a bunch of this work was a couple years ago, and there's been a bunch of papers uh, coming out uh, sort of saying, oh, but there's still drawbacks from this approach. So I don't want to oversell this approach of saying this is the way to to solve all sorts of editing things because there are some uh, there are some things that are still fragile with this approach but it does perform surprisingly well. And one of the interesting places this is, performs well is if you go to diffusion models, you have the same kind of issue. We have lots of undesirable behavior in diffusion models, like the way that they imitate artists that you don't want to imitate, where they generate porn when you don't want to generate porn. They have really serious societal biases where they think that all doctors and CEOs are white and male. And, and by using a Rome technique, um, we can directly edit these uh, associations and diffusion models, and it actually seems quite good. It's pretty robust. It's it's pretty um, uh, it's it's a pretty good method. Actually, if you were editing diffusion models, actually I would I would recommend it uh, here. So this this is this paper is called uh, I, oh I didn't put the URL link. I'll put it at the end. Um, it's called Unified Concept Embedding. Make sense? If you overwrite the model this much. At what point do you think editing the models uh, will still scale? So this, it's a good question. So every time you do direct editing like this, then you cause some degradation of other capabilities in the model. And so this is this is about the limit of how much you can change a diffusion model, uh, where we change, you know, about 150, 200 uh, associations. Um, uh, as well as changing a major item, like removing all nudity from the model at the same time. And when we change it to this level, the, 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 the you know, like stable diffusion, these large diffusion models, they, they have a slight degradation in quality, but not too bad. It's like pretty good still. And, but if you do a lot more, if you were to do like a thousand edits instead of just a couple hundred, then the degradation starts to become noticeable. Um, and, and so, so there, you definitely have this situation. Now, it's not that dissimilar to trying to fine tune a model on too many different tasks. Uh, you know, you would have some degradation in fine tuning as well. And so, the nice thing about this is that unlike fine tuning and some other things, we have really precise control, and it can it can be done very quickly because all the edits are just direct edits to the um, to the matrices. You know, you can you can do this set of edits in just a few minutes. Uh, without collecting any new training data. So, okay. So like the idea here, and I'm, I don't want to claim that this is all solved. This is all active research and we're trying to figure out how to get these methods to work better. But there's this common fallacy, right? Which is that there's some sort of mysterious, mystical trade-off between interpretability and performance. And I just want to, you know, if you were to say to Linus Torvalds, you know, I think that there's a trade-off between interpretability and performance, and you should accept my pull request of this crazy kernel patch, which is completely uninterpretable because it's the highest way of getting best performance. I think that he would just, I, he would have something to say to you, and he would not merge your pull request. There is not a trade-off between interpretability and performance for regular code, and I think it's a reasonable question. Why would we expect there to be some inherent trade-off between interpretability and performance for a uh, large-scale neural network? Um, uh, algorithms. It may be that we don't understand them well enough, but it may be that, um, but that may be our own limitations. So, so the goal of what we're trying to do here is see if we can lay a sort of a, a an ideal in front of us that really better interpretability should lead to better performance, better understanding of what the model is doing, and better control. Um, and so the method that we found that is useful for this is the same sort of uh, process of you, you identify the change you want to do, you look for causal effects, and then you check for generalization and some other uh, effect. It's the same thing that we did for LAMPS. It's the same thing that we did for ICL. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so these are my technical takeaways. Um, you, can, you can learn better uh, network internals by looking for these causal effects. And if you understand the structure well enough, it could lead to better uh, scalability. And um, and I just want to credit the students that did the work. This is Audrey Cui did. 
the work on relighting scenes, function vectors is Eric Todd's work. The unified concept editing team was this great collaboration over last summer uh, with Rahit, Hadas, and Joanna. And the, there's been a several papers. Oh, I should add another link here for the Rome and Memrit and LRE papers. And this is this is the team of folks who works on that. Um, and so, yeah, thank you very much. I think I went over, but uh, but I appreciate your attention. And uh, yeah, any questions, any discussion? Oh, sure. Uh, so we also have some uh, questions uh, collected uh, earlier. So uh, I think the first question is, uh, we have seen uh, many amazing examples uh, of uh, editing, uh, different editing methods. So uh, what, what kind of uh, task do you think this, uh, these methods are good at? And what, what kind of task uh, these methods probably don't, uh, it's, it's not that good at? Yeah, so something that I think that is particularly uh, like makes a lot of sense. So I gave you the example of diffusion model editing um, at the end. So I think it's a it's it's a actually a pretty good setting here. See if I can find where the diffusion model image was here. So basically, um, uh, so when when we edit diffusion models, what we're doing is we we have this th thing that we know we want the models to do. Um, so for example, let's take a look at the debiasing case, right? We, we like the models are really, they, they amplify a lot of biases. If you ask for doctors or nurses, it's always male or female, right? There's, there's all sorts of, they have these ethnic biases. If you ask for, a, you know, images of a housekeeper or something like that. Um, some of, some of the biases they have can be quite offensive. And, and so, you know, that, you know, you have these different problems in these models and, um, and we know how we want the models to behave, but it could be very challenging to try to fix the model by by coming up with a curated training set. Um, you know, like, you know, how do we remove all of the? So, like, like I'll give you an example. Like, if you ask for um, a CEO, then it'll be you know biased in a certain way, and you might try to curate it so that it it, it removes that bias by finding lots of pictures of diverse CEOs and including that in the training set. But then uh, what if you ask for like a successful CEO? Well, I'll tell you, it, you'll, you'll get the biases again. And and then and then what do you do now? Uh, you know, you have to go back to the drawing board and spend another $100 million on your large scale training. Um, and so, uh, so I think that this is actually a, a pretty good setting for doing this because one of the advantages of model editing is that you can do it um, very quickly you can do it after the fact, you can do it without introducing new training data, and you can very quickly evaluate and tune uh, the effects uh, that you're trying to achieve. And so it's it's a much better programming interface uh, than a data set. And it kind of makes sense, right? There's sometimes the effects that we want to create, you know, sometimes what you want is you want to imitate the training distribution. And that's what you want. But there are other times when you don't want to imitate the training distribution and you want something else. And when you want something else, then you want to understand how the training distribution is turned into model behavior. And then if you can understand it well enough, then you'd like to be able to edit that transformation. And that's what that's I think that's the area where, you know, it's really promising. Um, okay, so we have um I think Dhruv and Akshat, I'm not sure who raised their hand first, but how about Akshat? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, we see from like what also you said and other works that model editing methods, um, and I'm specifically talking about knowledge editing, sure. they're not scaling. So right, they only scale up to think... like they only scale up to like you know like a thousand edits or something like that, and you kind of run out of guess. Uh huh. Yeah. So like I mean like in the ideal realization of knowledge editing, I I imagine thousands or like tens of thousands of edits being made every right. day as new facts come yes. up. So yes. what do you think is the next step? Like how how do you create methods that also scale? I think it's a reasonable question. I think that so um uh you you know I so there are uh how do you create methods that also scale? I think that um uh you know to tell you the truth, my real goal is to understand the models better. And I feel like if we actually understand the organization of models better, if we actually understand uh, you know, 
I I don't so this 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 Rome hypothesis that there is a simple key value mapping from associations to the Eiffel Tower to Paris is something that we explain in the paper. It's a hypothesis that we confirm, but we also you know are upfront of, of the fact that some of the numbers are blurry. You know, it sort of uh, uh, you know explains a certain percentage of the causality, but not a hundred percent. And we have some follow-up work where, um, you know, we, we sort of show in this other paper, uh, the LRE paper, that there are um, some facts that are very cleanly represented by a mapping, uh, a Rome-style mapping in this way. And there's other factual knowledge that a model has that don't seem to be following the Rome scheme. They seem to be doing other things. And so I kind of feel like it would be like um, going to somebody you know, at the early days of discovering what a protein is and saying, hey, you know, we're, we're trying to like call, you know, cure cancer. It involves, you know, 40,000 proteins interacting in different ways and it doesn't work, doesn't seem to scale. This idea of proteins you have, you know, maybe proteins aren't a thing. Maybe we should be looking at something else. And I kind of feel like, mama, whoa, 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 whoa. We're, we're just at the beginning here. There's a lot of mechanisms to map out and understand. And I think that as we as we improve our understanding of what's going on, then we'll be able to, they, they will lead us to better performance. Um, and so, uh, so I, 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 I agree that our knowledge of what's going on here is pretty incomplete, um, and uh, and there's some work ahead for us. But one of the one of the odd phenomena is that uh, this this work actually has gotten easier as the models have gotten bigger. Um, some of the uh, effects, which are you know really hard to map out in smaller models, actually turn out to be easier to map out in larger models. So there's this hope that as models are forced to generalize better and given more training time, more training data, and more parameters, that they actually uh, arrive at better solutions that generalize better, that look more like algorithms, um, that look more like things that we can understand and manipulate in a sensible way. And so, uh, so I actually, I'm I'm quite hopeful for the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, Drew has a question. Oh uh, yeah, thank you for the lecture. Uh, sure. I haven't. I haven't really thought that much about this, but I kind of wanted to hear your takes on like adversarial attacks based on these function vectors and like kind of yeah. maybe yeah. like even injecting them. Like how yeah. would that? You know, from a research point of view, I think this is interesting. So let me let me give you the place where I think that the adversarial attacks are particularly interesting. So so like uh, th this this application that I showed you here, um, like here's here's like a simple application. So you could you could use one of our methods. We have a few different methods for like erasing an undesirable concept from a model. You might want to do this for privacy reasons, or you might want to do this just to like remove the tendency for models to create an offensive piece of content, like an offensive religious kind of content or or like nudity or something. Like so removing nudity is something that you, know, you probably want to do in classrooms in the United States. And um and so uh so now there's this question. When you remove a concept, is it really gone? Or have you just hatched over the model and said, you know, I know you still know this concept, but let me just like please turn this off, right? Like which one what if which one have you done? Right? And and you know, I don't know if we really know yet. Like we are our, our, again, our knowledge of these mechanisms are not is not complete. And so like an adversarial attack on this might be able to prove us wrong. Like we think that we've erased the ability for these diffusion models to, to be able to create nudity. But if you were to come along and tell us, hey, I, I've got I've got this cool adversarial attack technique and I've tried it on your erased model. And let me tell you, I have a sequence of uh, 11 weird characters that if I put this at the beginning of the prompt, the model is more than happy to like draw all sorts of nude images for me, right? You have not erased it. You've just... You know, slightly made it harder. Um, then, then I would, I would yield. I'd say, okay, you've discovered something new. <laughs> Let's figure out what's happening here. And so, I think that there's an interesting interplay between adversarial attacks and the types of, uh, you know, editing, fine tuning, edit, you know, model editing that try to do to create different effects. So, is that maybe that's is that one answer to your question? Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. Thank you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, there's another one. Yeah, uh, there's a single question. Yeah, I can yeah. I can read it. I can read it. That's okay. Thank you uh, for the lecture. 
Uh, from an AI security uh, perspective, is it, is it possible to add malicious biases into a model by directly by manipulating the parameters on purpose, like adding stereotypes? Absolutely. Um, this is actually uh, a, a kind of a concern. And so I don't want to be too political about it, but it, it gave me some discomfort when I was, you know, we we'd, we just presented the Rome work, uh, you know, a few months earlier, and I think it was at ICLR or something. And a young uh, Chinese student came up to me and said that there's a lot of interest in model editing um, in their lab because they have a lot of trouble uh, releasing uh, language models in China, and they need to edit the they ed they need to edit the facts, right? Which is which gives me a lot of discomfort because like I I think of editing facts as a thing that you would want to do to update them to make them more accurate, but you could certainly deploy these uh, methods to edit facts to make them less accurate to obscure the truth and to achieve some political goals. And so so this is a, a, a double-edged sword. I think that these sort of ethical concerns um, should be noted and uh, we should, you know, we should figure out, I don't know if there's a technical solution to them uh, because censorship sort of appears in all media, but, uh, but I think that, um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, we should be aware of the issues. I think that if nothing else, it, it brings it into stark relief because you can apply this censorship in let you know in different ways um and the fact that you can just directly edit models and you can do this really i think it reveals um a truth about these large neural networks which i think is important for the community to really absorb these things act so much like brains we tend to treat them as if they're like people or something like that right you know they're, they're these squishy things but they're not right they're computer programs they're creations of a person Right, they're creations of an engineering team, and they reflect the values and efforts and intentions of the engineering team that created them. And I think that that can be used for good things, and I can think it can be used for bad things. And I think it's really important for us to avoid sort of treating them like the way that we treat humans, as if they have their own intention or something like that. No, they're a reflection of the intention of the creators. They should be, and um, and and we should take responsibility for what they do. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm glad I was able to say that. That's my that's my little ethical point of view. It's it's nice to be able to talk to a a a a, a classroom of Berkeley students and share that perspective. So I appreciate the chance to to come here today and present to you guys. Uh, I think there is a hand uh, from, uh, from. Oh, there's another Drew. hand. Oh, oh, Drew, you have a follow up question. Yeah, this is a little bit different, but I was like wondering on. On like function vectors, a lot of like all the tasks in the paper, you guys are looking at kind of like semantic based stuff where you're like antonyms, like capitalizing. Do you think this will like, I don't know if you guys tested this, like on non like semantic based tasks, like where if it, it's like more like non-textual, like numbers based. Oh, number based things. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, we had a little bit of a bias against doing arithmetic and maybe it's bad. This is like bad because because everybody is doing arithmetic and we're like, oh, we don't want to write another arithmetic paper. And so we just, we didn't even test. So I'm, my guess is that a bunch of the number tasks will still work, but I actually don't have any experimental evidence of it. We should add it to our data set. We should have some arithmetic things. Uh, we did we did do structural things like, you know, uh, pick the first thing on a list, pick the last thing on a list, you know, this kind of, this kind of like string manipulation tasks. And, you know, they seem to work pretty well. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so, uh, so, I, but there may be that, so I wouldn't be surprised if we really stretched it further that we might end up finding that there could be some category of tasks which is actually done by a different mechanism. Um, that's always possible. But the nice thing is that we can directly tell. We can look at the attention heads and we can see yeah. Yeah. if it's the same ones that are being used or not. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh so uh, actually, uh, I have one more question. Sure. Uh, there's a recent paper uh, titled "Does Localization uh, Inform Editing?" Uh, I'm I'm not sure if uh, you are aware oh. of the paper. Yeah, let's see. Localization inform editing. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, its main finding is that uh, if we edit the weight, uh, some weight that is not the one suggested by uh, the causal tracing process. Oh yeah, actually, that one. The yes. Promise. Yeah. Yeah. I so may, may even get better. Yeah. I think that there's so I think that more further work has to be done here. So basically, yeah. So 
my I guess my my perspective on it is this. So um uh right, it they're they're a little bit chasing a different thing. And I, I worry I, I worry a little bit about that uh so to give context, so so Peter Haas and you know Bean Kim are you know terrific researchers and um and they 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 did a good job at asking a hard question about Rome, uh, which is which is this. So you know, we found that there was this interesting causal effect in certain layers of the network that really couldn't do much other than mapping, and so we hypothesized, oh, they must be storing knowledge by mapping, and so and we and then by editing them, we said, oh, we they they seem to behave that way. That's pretty cool. Now what what Peter has found is he said, well, if instead of storing the mapping at this location where you found causal effects, we could we could create the mapping elsewhere in the network and the network still behaves as if it acquired a new fact. And so I kind of feel like it would be like, you know, saying, well, you know, people hear out of their ears, but we discovered that you could add, you know, audio input somewhere else in their brain and they can still hear it. Right. <laughs> and and uh and, and isn't that amazing? And so like and maybe they could hear even better. Um, the, um, the, uh, which I think is a slightly different question that we were asking. And, and I'm a little bit, I am slightly concerned about the setup, um, because really our use of Rome for us was a validation that what we're finding with this sort of, you know, very clean, low parameterized causal experiment is, right. uh, you know, it allows you to edit. But if you right. if you if you trade it like a training objective, like oh we're going to like optimize the best way of doing this, I'm a little bit worried about overfitting. Um, I'm a little bit worried that you might find oh you know we can really do well by inserting this ability somewhere else in the network, but like our our data set kind of wasn't designed for that kind of training. Like we don't like maybe we don't do a good enough job at testing generalization. Um, and so there, like, according to our data set, maybe it's good to add, uh, the fact some, in some weird place in the network, but we don't know if there are disadvantages of that. So for example, just like thinking logically through how yeah. networks are structured, um, if you put a fact very late in the late layers of the network, then it's not available to any of the mid layers of the network. So if, for example, um, the network needed to know that the Eiffel Tower was in Paris in order to make some other inferences about the Eiffel Tower that it was going to make in the middle layers. And if you instead you put that kind of fact late in the network, the middle layer layers that might make inferences with awareness of that information will no longer have access to it. And the thing that I'm a little worried about is that, you know, maybe our data set is not strong enough at testing all of these types of uh, generalization, right? And so, um, so I, so I don't know. Like, so, like, I think that Peter, Peter, and Bean Kim are asking a great question, and they presented, you know, a good challenge. And I think that it, 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 it uh, maybe it rests on us and 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 then and in the community to to come up with, yeah. you know, yeah. more detailed tests to to understand why yeah. why you're seeing this gap. Does that make yeah, sense? this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of yeah. sense. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so uh, actually, uh, but maybe one last question from uh, Akshat. And before that, I, I want to uh, mention that uh, everyone, please fill out the attendance form before you leave the meeting. Uh, it's, in, it's in the chat channel. Uh, OK, uh, one last question from uh, Akshat. Yes. Yeah, thank Akshat. you. So kind of a follow up to you's question. Um, so I've read a few of few papers on knowledge editing, and for example, your paper on Rome uh, says that through causal tracing we trace facts or knowledge in the middle layers. There's an old paper about titled like knowledge neurons, sure. um, and they use integrated gradients and trace facts or knowledge neurons to the end of the network. Um, there are other papers, yeah, well, we, like, yeah, we didn't find the integrated gradients work that well, but yes, th yep, makes sense. I mean, so I guess, like, I mean, I was preempting the answer that you might give, but like, which one, like, how do you decide, uh, which one is the 
is accurately finding knowledge bearing neurons is it just like by using it or yeah i don't know i so i i i feel like um so you know the 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 test the method that we use um is really intended to be as direct a method as possible like you know we we like we we directly you know intervene in the network we directly put in this vector um uh you know th we have another experiment that I didn't describe to you where we uh we also shortcut the mlp um you know to either re you know force it to be used or not to be used uh when we're doing the the tracing so we have these sort of path dependent patches that we do uh to really narrow it down to the fact that the mlp is mediating um so i so i think that like for from our point of view um uh you know a lot of methods that you can do when you're looking for gradients and so on, uh, look for, they extrapolate. They look for local sensitivity. And when there's local sensitivity, they uh, extrapolate that this will probably integrate to, you know, uh, substantial sensitivity when, you know, you make a, you make a real change, not like an infinitesimal one. And, and so, you know, the, the, like, like integrating gradients is basically a Taylor approximation. And we're not doing a Taylor approximation here. We're actually making the change, right? And so, uh, so like my point of view is, this is the expensive, like slightly costlier, you know, experiment to do uh, that doesn't require you to make an assumption, and it gives you a different picture from looking at the local sensitivity. And uh, and I, I, you know, I I guess I I believe our picture uh, more because we actually actually did the change. Does that make any sense? Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, um, thank you. I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, like, it works better than knowledge neurons. So I guess that's a that's a litmus test as to yeah, no, and knowledge neurons is amazing. No, no, knowledge neurons is also amazing. I mean, so it's actually it was an amazing. It's, knowledge neurons actually inspired us to look uh, at it also, and we found the same issue, which is we actually tried to edit facts using knowledge neurons and so on. Like we're we're not able to do it, um, and we you know do causal effects, and it doesn't actually work. Um, but you can see these amazing correlations, and and. And you can so the knowledge neurons. When you look at neurons and you see amazing correlations, it can be an indication that you're nearby some structure. And so, so, so I think that you know it, it it's they saw a real structure there. Um, it's it's just that maybe you have to re rotate the basis a little bit to to bring it into you know, bring it to alignment. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I, I guess this this is the uh, end end of uh, our lecture. Yeah, it's great. I, yeah, I, I, I love I love the students. Don, you have great students. No, thank uh, you, thank you so much for <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks for, for, for yeah. a great lecture. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, oh, I have one. I have a thing to sell before everybody goes. There's there's a website. Hey, I'm going to give you a website. So for anybody who's interested in doing interpretability work. You know, we have this little community, and there's an open source community. Uh, here's a website. We're, we're we're trying to build some tools to make it easier to do uh, interpretability work on really large scale models. Uh, oh, so let me uh, get rid of how do I uh, send chat to everyone? Here it is. It's called nnsite.net. I should have made a slide, um, but it's like you know, open source uh, okay. uh, interpretability community. Uh, I will also post this uh, in our discussion yeah. board so that yeah. everyone can see it. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of fun, and uh, and so people are interested, and they can check it out. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Dave. Bye, you guys. Thank Bye. you.